Perani, as guest lecturer. Uh, Nader uh, has a double activity as uh, architect and principal of his new company called Nada, that is based in uh, in Boston. And uh, right now he is the director of the Department of Architecture of MIT. Uh, he will be showing some of his projects, but as part of his background for his research and education, he was during several years professor at Harvard, uh, GSD, and he moved to MIT like uh, three or four years ago. No, uh, We have many uh, different uh, uh, questions uh, or subjects uh, uh, with common interest. Um, the first one is that he opened, in fact, the first Fab Lab inside MIT. As you know, people from the Media Lab, MIT, our friend Neil Hersenfield, was starting the Fab Lab networks, but there was no any Fab Lab inside the MIT. And then when he was appointed as director of the department, he decided to, to create a laboratory of fabrication. And even uh, they are they are following some parts of the digital uh, fabrication, the how to make almost anything uh, uh, in the school of architecture. So from that point of view, we have a very clear connection uh, the way their students are educated and the way uh, the students are working here. Uh, in the other hand, uh, we I have been always impressed by by his work because he is one of the few architects in the world that is able to talk in a multi-scalar way. He's able to talk about projects related with fabrication, with furniture design, uh, structures, building houses, or even master plans. So I think that his background is very much connected uh, with the approach that we have at, at IAC, and that's why we are ha very happy that you are here. Thank you, Nader. Thank you. Um, this talk has not been theorized beforehand. It's a, in, to some degree, it's a kind of revisitation of a range of works, and then coming to the recognition that they, there is a, an undercurrent or a theme that is um, underlying them all. And uh, is this better? Okay. So um, the question of the relationship, yeah, I mean, you can turn off the light whenever you like, yeah. Um, there are many things that come to bear on the question of structure and cladding uh, between the ground and the sky and between modes of fabrication that essentially are about suspension. And in a way, this lecture is about one project. It's one project over and over and over again until materials are exhausted, scales are exhausted, and situ scenarios are exhausted. In fact, there's many slides, and what I would rather do is to go faster than slower and concentrate on a, a few arguments and let the images, in a way, uh, run for themselves. Um, the notion of suspension here is illustrated through the introduction of a corrugated wall on an existing building that we expand onto a third floor. A third floor, a second floor which never had access to the garden. The connection we make is instead of adding a structure onto the side of the building, we unfurl a corrugated wall illustrating that the structure of corrugation is, ver is rigid on one axis but malleable on the other axis. And in doing so, it proves the idea that construction and drawing are integrally bound to each other. That if you can draw a ruled surface, then you can fabricate it. So there's a connection made between fabrication and, 
and drawing. And, and that's a kind of foundational argument. Uh, the fact that it's suspended has also to do with the, the gap between structure and cladding. And then with it comes a, a whole range of arguments, not only about the nature of structure, but how you turn the corner, how you introduce openings, and so forth. Uh, that's another discussion about language and how uh, cladding and structure are interwoven to produce uh, a thicker plot, if you like. Um, if somebody is in charge of um, the contrast, the line weight is not going to show very well. But what this shows essentially is a rubber membrane roof that upholsters a building. And the argument again is that uh, here's a building that through a process of value engineering becomes draped. It becomes suspended over the building. And in doing so, uh, acknowledges the materiality of the cladding, the rubber, and its malleability, and vaults over the entry, wraps around the chimney, unbuttons itself in relationship to fenestration, the, the sum total of which uh, is an argument about figuration and their relationship to configurative processes. In other words, that the figure of this facade has a direct relationship with the vertical ribbons of cladding, none of which are cut. Everything's manipulated and respects the syntax of that aggregation. Again, suspension here has to do with the relationship of, of um, the configurative rules that preempt it. Embedded in there is an argument about disciplinarity, that architecture often looks outside of its realm in order to uh, find its rules. Uh, in tailoring or in the sartorial craft, we find this all the time. Uh, we, we, we find this uh, principle all the time. This is an important drawing that we cannot see, but imagine a rectangular panel here within which is inserted a dart. A dart, for those of you who can see my hand, is the gap between my fingers. A sheet of paper is like this. You cut it open, and by putting them back together, a kind of cupping is produced, a conical surface. And that conical surface produces the possibility of curvature, which in this case produces a kind of bowed uh, bulge here, an archway here, and a wrapping of the column. This is an installation um, at Harvard uh, many, many years ago that tests the rigors of the geometry in face of the material behavior of a thin ply wood, which is uh, grained on one axis uh, and therefore accepts rips and darts very well on one axis, but es essentially uh, has a different behavior on the perpendicular axis. Embedded within these darts is the possibility of programming. Uh, programming in the sense that it can accept structure uh, and the bulges may be able to be activated through uh, lighting systems, mechanical systems, and the whole slew of things that architecture has to accept. And indeed, concurrent with this, uh, we had the possibility of activating that principle in a pizza shop that was a very small project that needed to work with the existing profile of a ceiling, but also incorporate the ducts the sprinkler systems and all of that through a paneling system that addresses the street, that in a way theatricalizes its relationship to, to the front while accepting the penetrations of those things that architecture must um, incorporate. The shingling of, of uh, this panelization is rooted in the possibility of introducing a diagonal which in a way approximates a smoothened surface, buttons down three corners, but keeps the fourth one open for a bit of tolerance. Suspension here, of course, is literal. Uh, it is a hung ceiling, and uh, more often than not, the architectures within which we are engaged have to do with uh, the incorporation of multiple systems. Here, under a more classical framework in the darkest core of an existing building we had to introduce a spiritual life center with domes that were suspended down to eight feet over your head 
with a massive air circulation system and lighting system above. In other words, this entire dome houses an air filtration system where the whole thing is an entire diffuser. The domes then are a way of orienting a room to the west, to the east, and in a centralized fashion, and acquire different kinds of associations with different rituals. In turn, a, a new cladding system is introduced around the site to produce the illusion of space where there is none. And so depth and mood and different ambient conditions are introduced into the curtain wall conditions even though this is in the core of a building. Meanwhile, orchestrating relationships that also produce the optics of depth in a space which is quite shallow. The oculi in a way focus on certain rituals which would happen in the center of the space while the lighting adjustments at the periphery are gauged by a shingling system of glass that drapes to the ground where there are columns, lifts the skirt when there's lighting and the possibility of depth in the niches, and raises it to the top when there's doors and access ways. It's arguable that architecture is composed of two strategies. Uh, one is top-down and one is bottom-up. Top-down is, is a figurative practice. Uh, when I say basilica, you understand I'm referring to a church plan or a cross plan. When I say rotunda, you know I mean a circle. When I say bottle, you understand in a way the figure of the bottle. Often architecture is driven by figurative practices. Gary is one of those kinds of architects. In this case, an illustration of American football players in the 1950s, a common type of competition would entail that a team that can stuff more men into the figure of a telephone booth would win some kind of award. I'm not exactly sure what the ritual meant, but it, it has a certain homoerotic dimension to it. But what is important about the image is that there's no relationship between the form and the content. The content is not interested in the form. It's like taxidermy or like stuffing a sausage. And so in that sense, uh, it, as a reflection of architecture, it suggests an imminent disengagement between inside and outside, and yet that's a debate that we've for centuries been trying to quarrel over. What is the relationship between inside and out? Now, a different approach would be a configurative practice. Uh, configurative practices are not invested in form, but in systems, in relationship between part and whole, between a unit and uh, modes of assembly and aggregation. Now, Twister may play the same game, but in a different way. It lays out a series of matrices on the ground, and this is equally homoerotic, but in doing so, you roll the dice, but don't know what the final figure is, because each time it can be completely different depending on how you play the game. And so the emergent form essentially finds itself in relationship to where your arms and your feet get put. And so the final figure of that form really has to do with something that is more speculative than the precondition that the telephone offers. So my argument is that we're constantly, all of us, gauging a battle between configurative practices and figur figural ones. And, and certainly, my argument, in a way, preempts this one. Uh, my argument tries to make a case for a, a bottom-up approach while acknowledging that we cannot escape the figural uh, end. So, in this hotel competition for Ordos, we invented a unit, as it were, that was a hotel room, uh, which was composed of a party wall. Uh, a, it, in, it enabled various kinds of layouts for those rooms. Um, uh, in turn, it establishes relationships between inside and outside. But more importantly, it sets up relationships with the base that can produce shear walls, uh, in, incorporate plumbing systems, uh, bring drainage through it from the top, incorporate stairs, uh, incorporate rooms underneath, 
and in turn massive programs like swimming pools above. I don't yet know what the form of the building is going to be. I know that the system uh, is able to be distributed through space, through a matrices of courtyards that, I'm sorry again the plans do not show the, the reflected ceiling plan well, but a matrices of bedrooms that produce courtyard conditions that um, produce figurations of space the sum total of which are an impression of the content of the building without revealing it in a literal way. Um, we lost and we had to enact uh, that project through a very dense space of a restaurant uh, that was composed of more columns than space and in order to incorporate that strategy of holding all of the contents of the ceiling, the mechanical systems of an apartment building above, the drainage, uh, an entire infrastructure overhead. Uh, we encased everything in a canopy structure system that would conceal it while incorporating it and essentially begin to organize the discontinuities and misalignments of the space in a figural system that has the ability to uh, give it a single identity. Indeed, buckling to the section of the space, even taking you down to the basement below your horizon line on one side. Again, the seams uh, or the reveals are, is what this project is, is about. Every single bit of technical program is then aligned along these seams uh, as part of its architecture. The relationship between the ground and the sky cannot be more radicalized in spaces like restaurants or in this case gas stations. The ground is in need of flexibility. Before I came into this room, this, the chairs were uh, arrayed in a completely different way. If you have a pinup, you orient that way. If you have a lecture, you orient this way or you open this up. The ground has a different function and it's stubborn about that. The ceiling is altogether different. In a project that was about the recladding of a structure of a canopy for a gas station in Los Angeles, we realized that we could not simply reclad the existing rectangular canopy. Why? Because the extensions uh, of canopy in relationship to the dispensers had to be amplified, but unfortunately the structural system that lay underneath it could not take the loads of a larger canopy in total. And because of a huge pylon for a billboard system, we had to separate this structure from that because of the seismic zones. The sum total of which approximates a figure that along in relationship to the dispensers, it's wide, here, here, and here. And in relationship to the middle sections, the waste gets thinner. Now, as we look at gas stations and their history, we realize that there have been many ways of building them. Today, for instance, we prefab most gas stations. Pay booths are just built off-site and then uh, trailered right in there. Classical gas stations, old-fashioned ones, were a figment of architecture. They had a base, a capital, a shaft, uh, a cornice, a roof, and they participated in the discourse of architecture. Contemporary uh, gas stations require branding as their main communicative function. Here was a project where the client, ironically, wanted to go from British Petroleum to beyond petroleum and wanted to do a green gas station. In that process of rebranding themselves, they also wanted to debrand themselves, take the sign off completely and make an environment that emerges from the logo itself from the Helios and gives spatiality to uh, the gas station. So our mission was to develop from the Helios the idea of a, an organic system that can control all. Uh, a column that can become a capital and a canopy that organizes space but also distorts itself in relationship to uh, the urbanistic and code coordination that it has to undergo, become thin like signage, or even incorporate space when you want a pay booth in there. In other words, a triangulated system that has the ability of 
erasing differences while incorporating all of the functions inside of it. So a classic canopy, the pay booth, the signage evacuated of the brand altogether, and essentially a kind of entire environment overhead that takes the Helios, its triangulation, and essentially incorporates all of the services and the systems within it. So even in its details, the triangulations have the fire suppression systems, have the speaker systems, have the lighting systems embedded in them. The notion here was that somehow one develops a parametric system that is at once geometric, if you want to speak about it technically, but the parameters are the result of constraints. Structural parameters, mechanical parameters, functional parameters, circulational parameters, and at the end, this becomes a stealth signifier in the s suburban landscape. The actual brand, if you haven't noticed yet, then resides in those areas where you can actually communicate it. Imagine blades of grass with the words above it that say gas station. In a more complex project in Kuwait, there was no urbanistic response that we could derive the logic of a project uh, for. A client comes to us with over a million square feet of program and asks us to segregate into an office park here, a housing block there, a spa there, and so forth here. A kind of urbanism that emerges from uh, conventions that we have seen in, in the United States here and there and everywhere. And already you're beginning to see the vestiges of that kind of urbanism already at play in these sep uh, separate pods. Our mission was to essentially go to them and say, well, what happens if you do bring all of these programs together and in that single act give to the project the kind of urban variety of spaces and institutions that a traditional city has on the one hand, bringing continuity to the ground, while also giving it the kind of systematicity that a map building has. If you can't recognize this, it's right around your neighborhood, not too far away. The Escorial, in many ways, is a, a, a real modern building. Its matrices, in a way, incorporate a rationalized system of production and construction, while different typologies are rooted and embedded in there. So the question is not uh, the city versus system. The question is how can these two be construed not as mutually con uh, uh, in in exclusive, but really a both-and situation. The project is big. You can see it in comparison to New York, a kind of three-and-a-half blo block system in both axes with a variety of typologies that are embedded in there. And here, not challenged, typologies that are taken straight from the book or from Neufert and strewn all over the landscape, but with the introduction of one key element, a canopy above, which is a thick crust, a thick crust of housing that assures that the public space underneath is alive 24 hours a day, and in that sense gives vitality to it, not only urbanistically, but extends the life of the space in the hot weather by one month in each direction of the winter. The plans then, as I said before, are really quite off the shelf. The arena really responds to the best orientation of seating. Uh, the cinemaplex essentially are conical in shape, giving the best orientation to the screens. The housing is courtyard housing, but the marketplace is essentially a mall, and there's long span structure over the spa, and then there's hotel rooms here. All of these need to need one system to be brought together in a fifth elevation that is overhead in section. And that fifth ceiling is, is the reflected ceiling plan composed of a series of structural coffers that migrate from one geometry to another. A triangle, a square, a pentagon, a hexagon, in a way iterating itself until it goes full circle, showing the dynamic way in which each of these structural geometries may find their alliances in different ways to different typologies underneath. In other words, 
the typologies do not change because nature, the optics of a theater don't change that much, but the, the system or the matrix that binds them together must find a way to accommodate uh, the sectors in which they belong. Again, this is a reflected ceiling plan, rather invisible to your eye, so hopefully this will show. The coffering is composed of, uh, in this case, a hexagonal system that goes to a circular system, excuse me, circular to hexagonal, is this visible or hardly visible? Which is for the support pylons. The hexagonal system goes into a running bond system that performs the duties of the structural systems here. The running bond yields to a grid which aligns with the stores of the souks that you'll see up here. And the triangulation of that coffering naturally evolves into the orientation that is required for uh, the theaters uh, that you see on this side. Anyway, the logic goes on. The tension between the desire for continuity and the singular representation of a ceiling with the dissonances of typology is what persists underneath here. What is unimportant here is the facade. We do not care about what the face of this reads. The facade of this building is that space underneath here and how, in a way, through a differentiated system, all of this is held together. So these differences are then encoffered somehow and transformed in the structural system. Now, we won the competition, but it hasn't been built yet, and so we began to test these in a series of installations, this one for the ICA. And essentially, we tested it through a Voronoi diagram, thinking that if we develop a fluid system that deals with orthogonals and other forms of organization, it could actually navigate from arches to vaults to domes and many other configurations. And so incrementally we could begin to imagine sheet material that acts as that coffering system and essentially becomes uh, different depths and different organizations with respect to the configurations it has to control. Here a wall, here a twist, here an arch, here a ground, here a dome. All of these are configured slightly differently to accommodate essentially, this is not showing so I'm going to go forward, to accommodate various conditions of structure. Here the shallow part, here the deep parts. What you don't see in these images is the drastic way in which the structure failed. Because you don't see the six uh, tensile members that aptly fit into the theme of hungness in, in this lecture, but you see the way in which the fats or the blubber of the, the installation is showing on the side. That is the failure of structure and geometry coming together. The reason for that, of course, is simple, because coffering is strong this way, it is not strong that way. And so to rectify this, we had to go to China and reconceptualize this in the same installation with a different configuration. Here, a kind of twisted figure eight uh, plan yields a dome on one side, but a bowl on the other side. The dome offers a compressive system of structure and the bowl naturally, with weight on it, a tensile system. And then these two systems essentially work to give structure to not a system that is rooted in blocks that build up to a keystone, but quite the opposite, a series of cells that extend the keystone all the way down to the ground. In doing so, make possible uh, a, a speculative position with respect to structure that actually holds itself up. Now embedded in all of this is a kind of old argument that I've rehearsed in these previous projects over and over again. Uh, the idea that the liberties that we have overhead we don't share on the ground. Imagine the Dome of St. Peter's. Uh, representationally, a kind of the, the center of Catholicism, the way it, it brings in light, the iconography that's associated with it, this is the height of all domes. The ground, stubborn as ever, 
refuses to yield any pleasure. Its mere flatness is stubborn and dogmatic. But let's look back up at the dome again. It actually isn't a dome. It's at least two domes. The dome on the interior is not the dome on the exterior. So the thesis about the hung ceiling is actually persisting through a theory of tectonics that persists uh, a great range over time. Many of the domes that were built, uh, Florence included, needed the double shell system because it incorporated the one shell as a, as a basis for the construction of the other. And so the space between is actually quite important in imagining that architecture is composed of representational and actual elements. And tectonics is not about the way things are built, but it's the space between fact and fiction of building. Nothing can make this more apparent in the radical schism between the configuration of buildings and the figuration of buildings of certain contemporary heroes. Imagine the pleasure that you see when you see this and the upset when you realize that this is essentially the taxidermy of flat surfaces on the inside. There is no organizational uh, relationship between that and this. They are merely two systems that are uh, superimposed on each other. Now, that doesn't mean that all buildings are like that. And uh, if anybody, Rem um, radicalized through Jussieu and a series of other projects the possibility that the ground and the sky are speaking to each other in interactive ways. The problem is that that's 1% of commissions out there. The majority of commissions really deal with the world with shit like this. Uh, the mechanical uh, systems overhead, hung ceiling systems, that, dis, uh, that, that uh, conceal them, a ground that is lifted off to incorporate all of the kind of computer uh, cables and all of that. We live in a structured word of, wor world of cladding. It is cladding that persists, not structure. In a way, structure becomes uh, secondary to the very systems that activate it, sprinkler systems, diffuser systems, lighting, among other things. So in theorizing that position, we try to also radicalize it in the design of bank restaurants in Boston. Here, the radical flexibility that needed to be incorporated into the ground made it beneficial to inherit all of the systems above, the structure, the mechanical systems, even the wine room, the columns and everything becomes associated with the roof so that the ground is in a way yielded as a flat terrain accepting of anything. These tables uh, may be organized in any way, in ori any orientation for different events. Uh, the structure that's inherited from above produces the ribs by which the smaller structural systems are added. The figuration of the roof is in a way a shrink wrapping of the very program that it houses. Here's a, a system where uh, the reciprocity between form and content come into dialogue with each other. On one axis, revealing that content, and the other axis, producing the artifice of continuity, which is actually not there. At another scale, then, dealing with striation not merely as a diagram, but as a kind of constructed field. The plywood is composed of thin veneers of wood, striated at one scale, the, ba the zebra bamboo, bamboo is striated at another scale, and then the space itself is striated at yet a third scale. If all of this is about an architecture of optics, it is obvious because all of architecture in a way could be argued to bias visuality and vision. But there are few spaces that you deal with as part of an architect that in many ways cannot bias optics because the other senses, in a way, are trump cards. The toilet is one of those cases. We wanted to design a toilet that was thematized around the one unit, a unit of geometry that binds all of it together. In looking at the toilet, the toilet itself, its toilet paper, its sink, 
and the very mechanical systems above, the, diffu uh, the sprinkler systems, we realize is that the proto-circular geometry is the one thing uh, that could bind it all together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you took a shit under a massive, huge dome overhead? <laughs> and we imagined that a huge dome overhead would be the object of reflection as you sat on the loo. What the toilet is missing, uh, excuse me, what the dome is missing is the oculus, the space beyond. In, in its stead, the oculi inhabit another space on the wall, establishing a relationship between men and women which would normally not be allowed. In that space of vision, there are mirrors on either side where men see themselves in the space of women and vice versa. But more importantly, beyond visuality, let's be reminded that the toilet is a space of odor. And it is the odor that has allowed it to migrate from one side to the other. On top of that, there are sounds that come from the toilet. And in order to conceal those sounds, we had to introduce a kind of soundscape in there which is a recording of what those people are saying outside in the restaurant about those people taking shits on the inside. Muddled up in there comes together a kind of cacophony of senses. Now, if it isn't clear yet, underlying all of these systems of construction, relationships between form and contact, there is a kind of undercurrent of semantics, processes of signification, the production of meaning, and we're reminded that meaning is a slippery topic. There's no definite relationship between form and content. Uh, you remember the passage in The Little Prince where the snake swallows essentially, what was it? Uh, a hat. Uh, and in, in a way, uh, one doesn't remember what you're looking at. The, the double entendre or the kind of the slippage of meaning is embedded within all of the way in which architecture works. Literality is evaded at every moment through a slight uh, slippage in the relationship between form and content. And this is a kind of persistent theme that uh, yields all architectural work. Now. As a sister project to the bank restaurant, we were asked for a significant uh, financial company in New York to do a cafeteria and servery. 